Hey everybody, welcome back to Breakfast with Bob from Clash Daytona. My name is Bob Babbitt. We're brought to you by Toyota, Captiva Spine, Foundation Risk Partners, USA Triathlon. I don't even need to open my book when I speak <laughs> to the CEO of Clash Endurance, Mr. Bill Christie. How you doing, Bill? <laughs> this is like your happy time. Yeah, Christmas is coming, Thanksgiving is... No, no, no. It's, it is Clash weekend. It is. It Here is. It, the, the, the home of speed, right? This is the place. Talk a little bit about how excited you are about this weekend. You know, I, I, I tell everybody at this point, my work's done. Uh, the team is just amazing. And as we sit here and we watch them build this place yeah. and just watch it, it's magical. I mean, it's as magical as Santa coming down the Christmas tree, you know, and, and, and putting trees, you know, presents under the tree. So two years ago, we sat exactly in the same spot. We did. And talked about your vision, right? We did. And I looked around and said, I get it. This place is, this is Disneyland, right? This is Disney World where you could be, you've got a lake over there, you could swim, you could ride, you could be doing training camps, you could do Ragnar, you could do anything you want here because you're not gonna get hit by a car, right? It's totally blocked off from the world. True. It's the ultimate fitness location. And from two years ago to now, are you surprised of how far it's come? Or knowing you, you're probably thinking, it, we need to go faster. Well, first and foremost, I listen to you. So <laughs> you're one of the few. <laughs> well, I, I did. I listened to you. This weekend, we will have a band down in our Olympic Village. We call it the Fan Zone. Yes. Uh, they will be playing all weekend. Um, there is training camps going on. Uh, Jared Schumacher and Andrew Starkowicz and uh, Jody Stimson and others are going to be doing training camps for transitions. I love it. Swimming and biking. Um, the kids race, we moved to Friday night for the parents. Uh, it is everything I hoped it would be. Yes. And more. Three ring circus. It is <laughs> 11 <laughs> events uh, in three days. I said to the folks last week, we got to go to four. We got to go to four days. This is killing us. It, yeah, see, that's a deal. Yeah. There's no reason why you can't do four days. And no eventually reason. this will be a full week. And this year we're starting off with Daytona. And then you're back to Miami Homestead. Miami right. Homestead, it's not right. that far away. And um, Watkins Glen. Watkins Glen. And Atlanta. And Atlanta. And we uh, are being pressed aggressively by two other NASCAR facilities to add two races next year. Um, one would be an endurance race and the other would be a swim bike run. Right. Uh, but you know we've got a projection year after that that race is already on the schedule. So next year is going to be busy. Um, the team can handle it. They're just amazing. And uh, they're all going to be festivals. In fact, Watkins Glen, talk about a festival. Yes. Uh, the athletes will cross the finish line into a wine festival uh, inside the speedway of 30,000 people, one of the largest wine festivals in, 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 in the United States. And I, I'm going to race just because I want to drink wine. Uh, but the coolest part is whenever you want to have a crowd, you drop a race into a place where there's a crowd. Right. That's that. When we had the Olympic trials for triathlon back in 2004 in Honolulu, uh, everybody thought the race director was a crazy man. This guy named John Corf. It's like, well, you're trying to block off downtown uh, Oahu or Honolulu. And he goes, yeah, because we'll have 50,000 people who just happen to be there seeing triathlon for the first time in their life. There's nothing better. So the, no. that group who are drinking, the group that's drinking wine, a lot of those people won't be triathletes, but they certainly will be exposed to the triathlon at the highest level. Yeah, and you know, I, I, I tell everybody, NASCAR's deal is you come to a race, we got you as a race fan for life. Yes. And my view is you put on one shoe and you're doing something active and healthy mm -hmm. for life. And finishing in those venues, example, uh, let's just talk about it, Atlanta for a second. Sure. Atlanta, there is a Porsche Club Championship going on the same time we are doing midnight relays. Uh, relay teams, uh, half marathons. Yeah. Uh, they've got the Fox Factory mountain bike course that is on property. So as we're doing all our events, you finish all your events and or race your events right next to the track, obviously on the other side of the wall. Sure. But now you've got people who've never been exposed to NASCAR or motorsports racing and vice versa. Right. So the energy that you're talking about is real. And I just want to build on that energy. The other thing I'm, I'm really excited about is obviously I've been a big fan of tri clubs because mm -hmm. there's nothing that's the grassroots, right? You get people in understanding that we want you here, 
right? You're not competing against the other person. You're competing against yourself in the course. We are the most forgiving sport. And as we talked about earlier, the orthopedic reality is if you are just a runner out there and you think you're running faster at 50 than you ran at 40, it ain't happening. It's not true. Right? It's not happening. It's not true. But triathlon, if the combination of swim, bike, and run, you can do it forever. Yep. It is the ultimate lifetime sport. Well, you know the story of the 60 60- nine-year-old who passed me and i was having a great race yeah um for me i was having a great race it was a short course i was running 655s for wow my, for me that's for, out, yeah. outrageous yes and this guy went by me like i was standing <laughs> still like you're and i looked at his leg and it said and I, it saw his age and i thought to myself i just got blown out yeah <laughs> it's true yeah it's true my favorite story with age i'm racing and i'm passing a guy who's got a 38 on his calf, right? And I've got like a, a 55 or whatever the heck is on my calf. And you can hear him go, crap, right? <laughs> but then passing both of us was this guy named Hans Dieben, who is 70, right? And so then He's this guy goes, you he goes, shit! <laughs> That's like the ultimate compliment. No question. Right? No right? question. When you pass a couple of people whose ages don't add up to yours, is there a better feeling in the no, world? No, there's absolutely nothing, not. right? I, and to be to to be totally fair, the most joy I got yeah. last year in passing out awards was giving you your award as you were on the podium. Exactly. And had a great time doing that. Uh, and I passed out, as you know, I passed out a lot of helmets that weekend. A lot of helmets. Uh, but it was spectacular. Well, but- in the little touches, and we've chatted about this before, but the little touches, the, the trophies last year were the helmets, right? Race car helmets. Nobody's ever done anything like that. You, you understand from NASCAR that the little things are what matters. How lucky am I, right? Um, I didn't have to write the book. Right. I was just lucky enough to copy the book. And we've talked about that a gazillion times. But I, I want to go back to your team comment. Yeah. And the reason I want to go back to the team comment is, and you guys can't see it, but over our left shoulder is what's referred to as the driver owner lot. Right. And the driver owner lot holds 98 coaches. 98, okay, And there's motorhomes, a right, yeah. facility, there's a gym facility there, obviously showers. Yeah. And so on and so forth. But there's also a kid's playground. Right. So uh, Rennie and Tim are in a mobile coach right next to the kid's playground right. for their little ones. And the rest of them have been taken up by clubs. Right. So they've actually blocked in areas. For the different track clubs. For, it's unbelievable. So I, will that thing be filled up? It's already full. We're it's already, already full up. We've already, we've already got overflow into the second lot. Which See, is and that's the other thing that, that, that I was always impressed with here is it's a different vibe because – You've got motorhomes. People are staying here for the weekend, and they're going to meet people they've never met before. When you're staying in a hotel, you don't necessarily meet other folks. Well, Miami. Yes. You borrowed one of my bikes. Yes. You showed up. I opened the door. I pulled the bike out, and you went to transition. And you went back to bed. And then I went back to bed. (laughs) (laughs) So what do you see is the ultimate vision for this? How many events around the country? Or is that even that important, how many events? You know, we've grown so fast, and we've added so many to the schedule already. I I told everybody 15 in in five years. And I think, and I I have to give credit to Andre Lepar and to Philip uh, LaHaye. They pushed me. They came out of Atlanta and said, we're more than swim, bike, run. Right. I said, explain this to me. And I'll never forget it. We were sitting across the street, and you know our offices are yes. right there in, in the NASCAR building. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, have you been to the Atlanta? I said, yeah, I've been there a bunch of times. They said, do you know what's there? I said, no. And they explained the Fox Factory, right. the mountain Trails. biking, the yeah. trail running, yeah. so on and so forth. They said, we're going to use our non-lake facilities and mm-hmm. racetracks for endurance sports. Right. Half marathons, middle of the night relay races at 60 miles. Uh, gravel rides. Gravel rides, yep. gravel runs. And they said, it's going to be crazy. And I said, okay. And I'll never forget it. Andre Par looked at me and said, we are no longer a triathlon company. We're an endurance company. Right. Which we is gotta, why we it's change Clash name, Endurance. Which is why it's Clash Endurance. That and Clash, you know, Clash came from the fight between mind and body. Um, and that's truly the case. But Clash Endurance was, we're not a swim, bike, run company anymore. So the importance of television. Right from the very beginning, you have involved NASCAR TV yep. last year at Daytona. Yep. Huge race online. Yep. Same with Miami. Uh, talk about that and, and why, I mean, obviously, you come from NASCAR. TV is essential, right? They're a, a great partner. How important have they been as, as a partner for growing this? Uh, 
Let's talk about what we think the number of registered triathletes are in the United States. Okay. I've heard 400. I've heard 300. I've heard 200. I don't know what the number is. Okay. But what I can tell you is that we had 694,000 people sit in front of their TV and they didn't move. For last year? Last year. Wow. And so to put that in perspective, we also had 1.4 million people in and out of the broadcast. Right. To put that in perspective, if you look at all the Division One NCAA football and each one of the Big Ten, Big right. 12, Pac-12, um, ACC, uh, SEC, if you take the two team, two top teams that are competing against each other in those conferences and you take those numbers out on cable, yeah. we were just as big as the rest of the teams. Jesus. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So what that tells us is people are watching triathlon who aren't triathletes. They might be runners. They might be cyclists. They might be friends and family. They could be on their Peloton. They, they could yeah. be on their Peloton. My favorite is that uh, one of the guys told me last year that his wife hates triathlon. Won't go to see a race. But she sat there during the entire race. And watched. And watched and was entertained. So the NASCAR production folks do what they do well mm -hmm. and that is they put on live events that are high speed by that i don't mean fast cars going around the track i mean many things happening in a very short period of time uh they're phenomenal at catching the angles and i think when you look around at the other folks that have tried to do that mm -hmm. over the last year or so um it's been challenging and it's challenging for a number of reasons and one of the things that's the most challenging for them is having the talent of people who happen to have, and I'm going to brag about them for a minute, but they've got over 15 Emmy Awards. Uh, and that is something we are just lucky to have. So when I look at the TV, and it's funny, I'm watching the Olympics on TV and watching the Paralympics on TV. There wasn't one mention of speed, of power, of who's where. There was no... Arrows, leaderboard. There was no leader. There's nothing. Right. I think we've become spoiled, yeah. right? We're, we need that. And yeah. you guys are constantly going, okay, what else can we put in there? We want to have heart rate monitors. We want, to, we want to show power. We want to make sure that eventually we have cameras on everybody. You're taking it to another level. Uh, I, I think that one of the things I got to give credit to Keith D'Alessandro, who's the producer who's been mm -hmm. with us since, since day one. And his team, Roger and, and the, the director and the rest of the group, uh, Anna and Stephanie, and of course, Steve Stum, who runs that whole unit. Right. One of the things I've got to give them credit for is they sit back and they say, wow, this is fun, <laughs> right? This is something new. Uh, why don't we try this crazy idea? So the pointers, as you know, were yes. over the top of the athletes. And the pointers gave out um, speed and who the, the, the athlete was. The challenge with pointers is that you can't replicate them in the cut-down TV version. They do a great job on the live stream, ah. but on the cut-down, they're just not as consistent. You right. don't see as many as you want. So they said, we're going to go to what's called a lower one-third. So below each athlete, right. it will have... Who they are, what how their splits going, are, right, right. How, how far back they are. Right. And yeah. they can drop that data because it's important to them. And, and they really taught me this. Mm -hmm. Their deal is, look, the last athlete moving forward is as important as the first athlete and the second athlete slugging it out for first place. We want to know about the changes that are happening in 7th, 8th, 10th, 12th place. Yes. And those fights are as good as what's happening up front. And frankly, right. the stuff up front is kind of boring. Right. And so they continually push us to think differently. Um, and you know our motto. Our motto is we're a white sheet of paper. Do whatever. Do what we got to do. Well, and you think about it, last year at Daytona, what, Matt Hansen, George Goodwin, come, out, really, of nowhere. Coming out of nowhere. Right? Right? Out of nowhere. And you're going, oh, my God, that, which is why it's so cool. Yeah. You, before the race, you go, oh, it's Alistair Brownlee, and that's going to be it. And then it's all of a sudden it's Gustav, and it's uh, – And Gustav came out of nowhere. He came out of nowhere, too. Yep. Right. So, but it's, so when you look at this year compared to, you know, it's been – is this the fourth Daytona? Fourth. This is the fourth Daytona. Fourth year. When this first got going, was the plan to race on the track? What was the original plan? The original plan was we were going to race. Uh, the pros were, it was going to be a very traditional race mm -hmm. um, because that's all I knew. Right. Right. And so we were going to incorporate the track, but the track was not going to be the race. And we had a huge weather front come in. You had big rain. Yeah. Big rain, big weather. And knock on wood. It's been it looks glorious. Pretty good so far, yeah. It's been glorious for the last three years. 
um, we put the age groupers in the water knowing that we could get them out of the water and into the facility mm-hmm. quickly. Right. Uh, off the road into the facility and protect them if we had a lightning strike. Sure. We held up the pros and we held up the pros and it's probably one of the coolest stories there are that has, you know the story, I'm not sure it's been told by many. No. But the pros were in the green room, which is the Costa Club yeah. right over on the water and we had uh, spin bikes in there for them, we had treadmills in there for them and Andrew Starkowicz loved to death, loved him like a brother, walked over and said, hey, we need food. And I looked at him and I said, hey, do I look like a short order cook to you? <laughs> he said, no. I said, write down like reasonable people what you need and I'll get it. And uh, ZB walked over and he said, how's the weather? I said, we're going to know at 1015. So we had been tracking a storm cell since 614 that morning. I remember it's 614 exactly. Uh, it was coming out of Tampa and it had to reach outside the cone by eight miles. Long story short, Dylan McNeese walks up and says, if we're not going to rack until after 10, 15, why don't we do everything inside? This place is massive. I said, I, I don't know. <laughs> the next thing I know, Alicia Kay, Sarah Haskins, and Meredith Kessler walked over and said, we don't want to race in these conditions. We'll run. And I said, give me till 10, 15. Yeah. Uh, a little bit of time went by. I got on a chair and I said, hey, we know where this thing's going to be. We're going to be clear by quarter to 12. People were looking outside, and the weather was horrible. Yeah. And um, they said, how can that be? I said, folks, you need to understand. <laughs> Your weather's <laughs> we, up here. We, we, got, <laughs> we, got a, we got a weather guy looking at six Dopplers. We, we know exactly yeah. what we're, we're yeah. worried about. We're, we're not looking at our phones. Yeah. Usually have 180,000 people in the stands. Right. I mean, we, we're, we, we deal with lightning pretty well. And so um, the, <laughs> the next question was after Dylan walked up and Sarah walked up and Meredith walked up and Alicia walked up, uh, they said, okay, if we're going to do it inside, there was a negotiation between the pros. Right. And I mean, they were all in the room. Yeah. And Starkey obviously wanted a longer bike, and yeah. Hemrick wanted this, and you yeah. know, Dylan McNeese wanted that, and Sarah wanted this. And Dylan wanted the seven-mile swim. Of course he did. <laughs> the guy's a fish. And uh, so here we are, and I, and I stood back. Right. And I let him work it out. Yep. And they came up with 100K distance. And it has stuck as the Daytona distance, and we do it entirely inside. And I don't think people, until they get here, understand the magnitude yeah. of what 840 acres looks like inside. Right. You can take every professional football stadium, baseball stadium, hockey stadium, and add the Florida Gators, and add UCF Stadium, and you still have landmass left over if you put everything inside this place. So one of the things that, that people come here for the first time, and when you're here, you don't see how steep the bank is, <laughs> right? And I know there is some real technical formula they came up with, right, Highly to figure technical. out the bank. How, high, high geometry. How, how did how'd you come up with the bank? So the geometry with that was uh, they were building the track uh, in the 50s, obviously, 48 was the founding of NASCAR right. in the 50s. And so back then you'd think that there, you know, the civil engineers came out and the geometry was done, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> the, the two biggest issues were the curvature of the earth and the flat nature of the track. Yeah. That was done with bulldozers. And the 31 degree high banks. And the high banks are the middle of the turns. And, and when we speak in terms of this oval, turn one is the beginning of, of the rounded edge. Turn two is the ending of the rounded edge, turn three is the beginning, turn right. four, and then you've got the trioval right here, which is why they call it a trioval. So they go through all this geometry. No, they got a bulldozer out there, and that was the steepest the bulldozer could push dirt without rolling over. And that was, that was, <laughs> that was the high-tech method. 31 degrees. 31 Boom. degrees. Perfect. 31 degrees. What's, and there you have it. What's been your biggest surprise from watching this race now for four years? Was there a moment where you're like, oh, my God, I never thought that would happen? the energy of the people crossing the race yeah. and saying, I've never experienced anything like this in my life. Yeah. Yeah. The people crossing the line and us putting out 600 feet of red carpet so that everybody could have a world championship experience, whether it's their first race, right. their last race, their competitive athletes, whatever it is. This is, we know, the fastest course in the world. Right. right? Um, the PBs here are outrageous, but the thing that's special for me is the kids race. Yes. And watching, and I'll, I think I've told, have I told the story about, uh, I have told the story no, about Bella. So Bella uh, was five years old. She was the last one out of the water. She was about 
10 feet from shore. Um, and she had seven lifeguards around her, two of which in the water next to her. Move your arms, move your arms. They get her out of the water. Her mom's on a bullhorn. We gave her a bullhorn. Mom's on a bullhorn. Get her out of the water. Uh, Andre Lepars, she speaks fluent Spanish. Andre Lepar is the only one who speaks good fluent Spanish yeah. on the team. Uh, somebody's got a follower to make sure she's on a bicycle. It's got tassels. It's got a basket. It's got, you know, everything but training wheels. She's out on the course. She's running around. I've got my radio leaning out of the golf cart so Andre can talk to her in Spanish. Right. She comes off the bike course. She comes down the red carpet. There wasn't a dry eye in the house. You want to know my favorite moment? That was my favorite moment. That, of course it was because yeah. you changed somebody's life. I love it. Pretty special. Billy, thank you, man. This oh. is, this is our, our just our favorite weekend, just coming down here and, and just – watching people have the experience of a lifetime there's nothing better we love having you. you you know we do and and i'm excited to watch you race uh <laughs> bring your sundial <laughs> Nobody, remember i'm in the 70 to death category now really? i'll be out there a while i might need a light stick <laughs> i got you sprint. i got you don't worry but hey we love having you guys here we're excited uh we know you're going to spend a lot of time with the age group folks they're excited to have you because they don't get to talk to bob babbitt um, somebody said that they saw you at, uh, at a restaurant and you had met them and you remembered their name and they sat down and they talked to you at breakfast and it was a real special thing. So I appreciate you guys being here. Love it. Bill Christie has been our guest, CEO of Clash Endurance. We are down here at Clash Daytona. Very, very special weekend. Tomorrow we've got a full slate, 20-some interviews tomorrow. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll catch you next time. See ya. <laughs>